But what is the one component that all of these sports teams has? Now, obviously, they all have, if it's football, the you know, owners, coaches, players, but what's the most critical component? It's not the man that has the pocket book to pay for all these multi-million dollar people it's the coach would never think of putting a fielding a team without a coach and the funny part is the coach doesn't make anywhere near some of the top players that are there but he does make some good money the coach says all the time if i have a plan at the beginning of the year a vision and a plan with those players how i could win the super bowl if they follow what i lay out and it will take sacrifice they're assured to be Super Bowl champs. And that's true. They all have this game plan of attack. Some coaches are really good at it, some weak, and yet you'll see an underdog win. But that story lives right here. Christ gets baptized. The very next moment, the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of Christ. That's the coach. Leads him into the wilderness, and for 40 days, he's out there. Ironically, it parallels 40 years of journeying the Jews. And the people were so disobedient that God say, I'm not giving you the land that I promised your forefathers. No, no. He said, yeah, you're going to have it. But you won't step a foot on it. You'll stand on this stage. You wandered 40 years. Your disobedience. You want to order, uh, you want to... Um, bow down to golden calves you won't come off this stage but you'll see the golden you'll see the promised land of milk and honey that i promised your forefathers your nation will have but it won't be your generation that's how disobedient these people were god never took it away he gets baptized the dove uh, the holy spirit descends on christ he wanders around for about 40 days. It actually says 40. About doesn't matter. And at that moment, the coach says, I've been preparing you for the adversary is coming. Satan and temptation. Now, while he's wandering, there's fasting. And the question is, how do we fast? It's here. It's part of it. There's fasting that goes on. There's a communal with God. And the big question is, it states that there's a good amount of temptations that Satan is laying at Christ's feet. Now remember, and I'll read this, Satan can never force somebody to do this into temptation. Cannot. He can offer it. Man must take it. Or not. It's the best that Satan can do. But Satan is the prince of this world. This ungodly forsaken place down here in the way that we act. And we make this what it is. God didn't say, I want it to be sinful down there. It just, it is. Satan offers, we either step over and taste it and get back, hopefully, or we stay here. This is fine. Forty days wandering. Satan comes on, and the story lays out three temptations. Now remember, it's going gonna, it's gonna to talk about those temptations were all throughout the 40 days. But three are brought forward by Christ. Why those three? That's the big question. You've got to ask it. It's prompting it. If that doesn't come off that page, get back into your Bible because you're not reading it properly. These questions should be right out. Why those three? Let's explore. Chapter 4, verse 1, Matthew. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Who wouldn't become hungry? at that point and the tempter who's the tempter satan verse three and the tempter came and said to him now satan's talking to christ if you are the son of god command that these stones become bread i love the king james because it's a lot more graphic but this will get the point across if you are the son of god simply command these stones to be bread the question is why but we'll, we'll take a look through that. Verse 4, But he answered and said, Now it's in red, must be Christ. It is written. Christ is saying, It is written. This is Deuteronomy 
Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We cross right over that line. Verse 5, And the devil took him into the holy city. What would the holy city be? Jerusalem. Luke actually says it. Many times the Bible in the New Testament speaks of the holy city. There is only one holy city. It is Jerusalem. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. Notice, not on the top of a church. This is where the sanctuary stands. The temple. Put Christ up on the temple. And said to him, this is Satan talking, it's in black. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Now why would Satan have said that? That's a totally different reason this temptation will cover it. But he knows scripture. That's why he's laying these out. That's again, Deuteronomy is coming up. Actually, that's Psalms 91, 11, and 12. And he's going to hit this. Satan says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Satan's telling Christ it's written. But he misunderstood what the words said. He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Satan says that. That is scripture. Psalm 91, 11, and 12. Jesus said to him, because he's misquoting at that point, on the other hand, it is written. In other words, let me say to you, and this is what Christians on TV do all the time, that is a total misinterpretation of what was written back there. I'm not saying you've got to understand everything, but instinctually you should know, whoa. When I listen to some of this stuff on TV, it's like a half-truth or a blatant lie, and they want the congregation to believe it. Stop. That's flirting with temptation. I'm leading you into a very bold direction you've got to grasp. If you want to understand God, you must understand his word. Because Satan just twisted just a little. And Christ said, that's blatant. That's glaring. You are wrong. In red, Jesus said to him, verse 7, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. This is the third test. And, show, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Now, before we hit 9, I've had, and I haven't even read what we're supposed to read yet, but before we hit that, that part right there is what brings a lot of commentary people to say, well, I wonder what this was. Was this a, this is a parable, it could be a parable, could be just a story, and they're having this conversation today, um, or it, was it literal? So most, a lot of the commentaries say there's no way this story can be literal. None. There's no mountain high enough where Christ could stand on it and overlook and see kingdoms all around the world. Because Satan is saying, take a look, see all of that? And all the grand and glory those kingdoms have, it's yours. If. So that's how wrapped up we get in some of this dingy stuff. Oh, let's have commentary and go right off the track and talk about whether it's literal, world, parable, story, whatever. You guys can have at that. Eight. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. In other words, this is what I have dominion over, Satan is saying. All of this here may have been created by your father, but it, they bow to me if they want to live here. And we're acting like that too. And again, Satan said, and he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Three tests, each one for a very specific reason. And that's what should be coming at you. Why those? What the heck? So they're tests and Satan said, go away. I mean, Christ said, go away and we get to the end. Because remember, this game, this battle will be for the Super Bowl. At the very end, it will be Satan and Christ alone. And they know each other. 
We know the outcome, and that's why we sit back and we don't have to really worry a whole lot. But we got work to do here on earth. Book of James talks about that. Nine, and he said to him, all these things I will give you if you bow down and worship me. Ten, and here comes Christ getting ready to talk. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written. This is Deuteronomy 6.13. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. That verse 11 is absent inside of Luke. And the only other difference in Luke is the sequence in order. The second temptation is swapped with the third. It's not a big reason or a big, big meaning of why would that happen. That doesn't much matter. And it's okay that Luke leaves out that the angels, after this temptation, are ministering to Christ. Now, what happens right after this story? Christ launches out on the greatest ministry the world has ever known. That's the sequence of events. Baptism, temptations, 40 days, preparing and then delivering through temptations. Went through 40 days of temptation and came to the end and, and then Satan says, this is the last three, but they're here for a reason. We're going we're gonna to hit those and they're very easy. And then after that, Jesus said, you step away. Satan's going to go away for a while, not forever. And Jesus is going to launch out in the ministry and he's going to lay down. As far as I can tell, and I promise you I have read this book somewhat thoroughly, I have never found where Christ assumes something, a miracle, if you will, or using his divine power for himself. I've never found it. I'd be willing to stake most of everything I got except my eternity on that statement. I've seen it many times in print. Nowhere can it be found that Christ used his divine power. What's the first thing that happened? He's hungrier than beyond all whatever. And the first one here, if we go back, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Satan is saying... Think of yourself. You have the power. You could do away with hunger right now. You're going to hang on the cross one of these days. See, they can have these conversations. They don't have to verbally talk. You're going to hang on that cross. What happened on the cross? If you are the Son of God, save yourself. Really? First of all, I'm here for a reason. So the moment that Christ would have made that decision, sure, you're right, I'll feed myself. He didn't have to worship Satan over that line. Feed yourself. If you're the Son of God, feed yourself. How many times in the New Testament have you seen where they, people are asking, just prove to us that you're God? Really? Will you be okay? Will you believe us? Will you be on your, your life of ministry for us, for me, God? Well, no, I'm just asking, you know, yeah, well, you'll, you'll, you'll believe in me now. I'll do a miracle and then you'll step right back over into temptation and there'll be a problem tomorrow. But most importantly, nowhere did Christ say, I am because I have the power. I am going to do something for myself. It reminds me, remember that sitcom Bewitched? The big thing about Bewitched was that she was tempted so many times to twitch her nose to help herself. And how many times did she say, I won't do it. Here comes aunt, whatever it is, and uncle, whatever. Just do this, you know, and you can get out of this. I will not do it because I want to be a mortal. I won't do it. Christ never did it. Why also? Because the moment he would have, he would have never been perfect. Christ was here for a mission. And he steadfastly said, obedience-wise, I will adhere to the reason that I'm here. And that is to fulfill the cross. So, before I read Luke, I'll read you just... What's Luke? I've already gone over that. I'll read you just a few things that lay out where we've been headed. There are special times when we want to commune with God and it's absolutely essential that we do. Certainly, for Christ, it's right after a mountaintop experience. What was that experience? Baptism. 
And baptism, okay, I got baptized in Vegas, um, but there's no reason I can't get baptized again, and there's no reason that I can't live as being baptized every day. And I'll tell you, and I'm not just throwing this out lightly, there is somebody here tonight that I would say exemplifies that. Because all he talks about is heaven. All he talks about that is the, th the one thing I am for sure. I don't know when I'm going to go, but I know where I'm going to go. And I know who I get to serve. And I don't think we have to talk about who I'm talking about. But why can't we have that every day? Then we may take a little bit more attitude about I'm allowing all these babies to die needlessly. I look at Devin and I think, somebody could have made the decision, no Devin. Really? Yeah. And that's it, just a decision. Absolutely essential to commune with God, like a mountaintop experience. That's Christ's baptism. Before a great trial or time of temptation. Before I've got something coming at me, and I, there's times when I have it coming at me, that's a time to commune with God. Christ is going to show us how. We're going to hit that before we walk away. And third is great periods of, or, or periods of great service, of ministry. The problem with great ministry, David Jeremiah, uh, Dr. David Jeremiah, Dr. Charles Stanley, great periods of great ministry is the temptation. They all love me. Man, they got to be very cautious. Pastor Burks drilled that in me. You step up here. I don't ever want to hear you tell somebody how great you thought you were. Or get off. That's the temptation of being up here. Communing with God. The devil attacks anywhere and everywhere. It's a for sure in your life, the devil attacks. Certainly he attacked in the wilderness with Christ or in the city with, when I was in Las Vegas. He will attack. And, excuse me, and the thing is, Moments of weakness is what he's just waiting for. The more a person seeks to serve God, the more you can expect that you are going to be tempted. And sometimes as I get very learned in here, the temptation rises to this occasion. Oh, so you think you know it. So do I, says the devil. I'll make sure you still have temptation. I won't force you. I can't. But I promise you, I probably can snag you. The more you rise to prominence with Christ, and my wife told me this, and I thought she was a nutcase. No, the more I rise with Christ, the more I cancel out, the devil will leave me alone. No, that's when he comes in. The more you, a person seeks to commune with God is more that he needs to absolutely be in path with the Holy Spirit and God. That coach, the Holy Spirit. Christ was, it's said here, that Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Luke's, I love, because it has Holy Spirit twice. So if I do Luke chapter 14... Verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Now, you cannot be full of the Holy Spirit unless you are in the Holy Spirit. I can't have the Holy Spirit dabble and touch upon me and then go away. I've got to bring the Holy Spirit in. I can't say I'm thirsty as all heck when I'm in Vegas and you get thirsty, but you don't even realize you're thirsty. I've got to get this in me to let the thirst do the work it's supposed to do to kill the thirst, the water of life. I got no options. I can't dabble with my finger and touch it when I'm thirsty. I must put the Holy I must be in the Holy Spirit. I must understand something about the Holy Spirit. How do I know when the Holy Spirit's talking? That's our problem in Christianity. We don't. I got no clue the Holy Spirit's trying to talk with me. If I had a clue, then I can be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the coach. Holy Spirit has the big picture in mind and will always lead me down that path. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. Twice the Holy Spirit's brought up. 
How many times do we talk about, our, about the coaches? Well, on TV nowadays, they do it a lot. They didn't used to do it a lot in the sporting arena. What about Paul? Paul's coach. Has he ever been talked about? Yes! Who? Gamaliel! It was his coach, his mentor. He stood by his side. He's mentioned twice in the New Testament. What? Yeah. So, I'll get back to him. So, let's boil this down. God does not tempt man. God allows man to be tempted for the same reasons he led Christ to be tempted. And here's some of the reasons why God allows man to be tempted. To prove and demonstrate my faith to God. God does not tempt man. And don't you dare tempt God. But he allows it to build the faith. And that is what Jesus is laying down. There must be faith. Oh, just turn the bread into, into the stones into bread. Does he have faith if he did it? No. That's why that first one is there. Secondly, to strengthen and prepare me for heavier responsibility. That's why God allows temptation. How many times do we just say it's we have to go through life, right? No, it's the temptation of life and can I say no to the credit card? Can I say no to living with a woman before we're married and having sex? Can I say no to supporting somebody to go get an abortion? That I'm too young to understand these things. No, you're not. The heavier responsibilities are going to come in life, so temptation is allowed to happen, to build character, we say. And if we are tempted and we see no way out and we cross over that line, why the third reason for temptation? To demonstrate the mercy, grace, and power of God in my life. Because when I walk over this line, guess what I'm screaming? How many people who are non-believers say, God help me? Please. Wait a minute. You don't even go to church. You don't believe in God. You're, you, you blatantly say it and you're saying, God help you? Seriously. God allows the temptation to bring the obedience right back. That's the beauty of temptation. If... We observe it from afar even better. If we just touch it, great. But most of us have battle scars. Paul. What was his biggest battle scar? He wore them. I persecuted the Christians. I did what I could, but I crossed over the line. And Paul knew it and he said it. I had somebody put to death. And I sat and watched Stephen. He knew it. There is no coming back from taking one of God's creations who did nothing but wanted to forward Christ. How could Paul have ever been given a second chance? So Christ met temptation by doing three things, and I told you we would boil this down. The first one is he learned obedience, the control of his body, mind, and spirit by going through these temptations. The second, and I'll show you what each temptation meant. The second is to secure righteousness. He was the ideal perfection, sinless man. He didn't succumb to any of these temptations, didn't even give him a thought. He responded immediately and clear cut. And third, to experience all the infirmities of man in life. Christ went through the temptation so he could understand the evil that is out there and so that he could, and here's the word, succor man. Succor man. Christ went through these temptations so he could understand the evils. He understood them, but now he can physically say it to succor man. Give assistance or aid to man. Bring the temptation, I'll say no and I'll tell you why. So here it is. The, the three things, here's the main point. So how does Christ, how do we approach temptation? Christ spent time alone with God. We said 40 days. Alone. 
Now, some say you have to go into a wilderness. What happens if I'm in Vegas? You want me to go out in the desert? You crazy for 40 days? Some, some do. I'm not saying that. How many times have I heard people say to me, I can be in a room with people and I feel so alone? It's exactly what we want. We want you alone. I don't care where you are. Can you study with a bunch of people running around here? Yeah, I'll go sit over there and I'll study. If I can get my mind wrapped into Christ, I, got, I stand a chance of studying around people. You don't bother me. Well, I hate to bother you. No. You must spend time alone with God. And I don't care if you're sitting right here while I'm doing this and you're wandering, but you're alone with God. That's what Christ was. Didn't have to be a wilderness. We are in a wilderness right now. Trust me. Our world on earth is in a wilderness. There ain't no safe haven down here. Tell me where. Oh, in the church. Right? My opinion is close all the churches. They're a convenience and they're not honoring the word of God anymore. The second, Christ made sure he was led by the Spirit. So, I'm saying to you, section yourself off. Commune with God, you and God only. This is when temptation happens. And I don't care how long it is. God, just show me which way to go. That's what I hear. I love it. Just show me which way to go. Should I take the job? And then they tell me, uh, as I'm showing houses, if they really want me to have that house, um, and, and then I would have it if God wants it. So what are you doing to get the house? I'm just sitting back, waiting. What are you doing to get the job? Well, they'll call me if they want me to have it. If God wants me to have it, um, they'll put uh, 200000 in my bank account and I can travel across the world and get it. I swear I have heard these things. Seriously. My wife and I decide we're in Nashville. We're coming over here. We had a two-year plan. Accelerated evidently with her to your plan to get here, and it was the toughest thing I think I've done in probably 20 years of my life. I said to Pastor, there wasn't a darn thing easy about it, but I knew it's where I want God wanted me to be. I knew it, I felt it. I didn't even once say, Are you crazy, Cookville? And then I got to Cookville. And the very next day, what did I do? I kid you not, Pastor will show, will prove me right on this one. Pastor, I feel I came a long way, but I ain't home yet. He said, give it some time. I know where you're coming. It's Clark Range. I knew it the very... Third one. One word. Compromise. Temptation is compromise. The first one is self-indulgence. It's what we got going on in my, my life today. The second one is the spectacularism. You go to a church, what do they call it? Those feel-good churches. They have them. We're going to do everything we can to make it soft and easy and a feel-good church. That's spectacularism. Wow, they do a light show in Vegas. Let me tell you, they do a light show in Vegas. I want to send you there just so you can see this light show so you can emulate that over here on our stage. Of course, it runs about two and a half million a year just for light show. But man, Terry, come on. I guarantee you that whole section's filled. Self-indulgence was the stones and bread, the pinnacle and the tower, spectacularism, and there's some incredible light shows in Vegas, and then the third one, compromise. What did Satan do? I'm going to take you up and show you the entire world. It's all yours. If. If. You bow to me. Compromise. Those three things. We already talked about what Christ, is at, what Christ says has to happen when any of these three things in temptation come. And it's amazing. Every piece of temptation you can think of is outlined in those three. Why those three? Find me one that doesn't lay in there somewhere. And a lot of the temptation... And as I've been looking at all these temptations I can possibly think of around the world as I look at it, glitz and glamour, spectacularism, whatever it is, oh, take down the uh, Ten Commandments that shouldn't be here, self-interest, you know, we have a right to have our voice heard. Why, do they really, do you not try and live, you person who don't believe in God, by, by those, or do you think that my wife is up for anybody to take? Oh, what are you, crazy? These three were that critical. The only difference in Luke, at the very end, the angels didn't need to administer because Luke says that the devil at the end left him for a short time. Didn't say anything about being ministered to, but Mark, 
and Matthew both say the angels came to minister to Christ after this temptation to get him ready. To get him ready for what came after the temptations. The greatest ministry ever, the earth ever, had a chance to witness. So they had to get him ready now for the next jaunt. And man, what a ministry it is when you read it in that fashion. There's other things that we can talk about in here, but I think it's laid out pretty cleanly. Spend time with God alone. Make sure that you are led by the Holy Spirit and rely upon the Scripture. It's all in that story.